Here are the top local news stories for 2017. It was a sad beginning to the year, with the untimely passing of our former Chief Minister Pahin Siri Datuk Patinggi Adnan Satem on January 11th, just 10 days shy of his 73rd birthday. Well known for his passion in the reinstatement of Sarawak's autonomous rights and its status as an equal partner in Malaysia, Adnan's passing was met with much grief from the public. And as a sign of respect to the late Chief Minister, the state government declared that a seven-day mourning period would take place. His wife, Dato Ama Jamila Anu, related a few days before his death that Adnan had said he loved Sarawak and wanted its people to love and care for the state as much as he had. She recalled her husband was cheerful in the last few hours before he breathed his last. He decided to take a bath and put on new clothes before asking to be seated facing the view of the forest from his room. He then asked one colleague, one Muhammad, his private secretary, to read to him what was going on in the state, including matters pertaining to state autonomy, particularly on education and English. She told the Borneo Post at her residence when the team from the paper went to pay their last respects to the great man. I am Adnan Satem. I refuse to have a government when there is no Chinese in that government. I am Adnan Satem, and I don't want Amno to come to Sarawak. I am Adnan Satem. Give me a big mandate so that I can speak up to Kuala Lumpur. You listen to me. I represent Sarawak. It is not an overstatement to say that Adnan's last wishes, consistent with what he was doing during his tenure, has shaped the direction for Sarawak in 2017 as well as moving forward. Without a doubt, Adnan had left Sarawak, and although he has served a little less than three years, he had laid a strong foundation and set a clear direction for his successors and Sarawakians as a whole to continue with the pursuit and eventual fulfillment of the state's aspirations, especially on the reinstatement of Sarawak's autonomous rights and its status as an equal partner in Malaysia. The state in dire need of a new leader, Dato Patinggi Abang Johari Tung Openg was sworn in as Sarawak's sixth chief minister on January 13. At age 66, Abang Jo has had an extensive political career spanning over 40 years since 1977. Calling himself the new captain of Teen Adenan, Abang Jo vowed to follow through on the late chief minister's programs for the betterment of the state. Speaking at this year's launching of Kuching North City Commission agenda on February 6, Abang Jo famously said, I will carry on Dok Nan's legacy. Maybe there would be a little change because I cannot be a clone. Just like Dok Nan's, ooh ha, you, you, even if I were to emulate him. I would not be able to say it exactly like he did. So I will have my own approach, but the fundamental is the same. Of course, we want to improve and the emphasis is still on rural development. Since Aban Zhou's appointment as Chief Minister, state affairs have seen vast changes in terms of development in the past year. With an emphasis on bringing the state into the new digital era, the Ministry of International Trade and E-Commerce was created on May 7th with Dr. Siri Wong Sun Ko taking charge as minister. And following that, the Sarawak Multimedia Authority, SMA, was launched on December 12th with the unveiling of the first version of the Sarawak Digital Economy Strategy Book 2018-2022. to SMA would oversee and regulate the state's digital strategies and initiatives. Not forgetting our country's vibrant oil and gas sector, the state also took a step towards more involvement in the upstream oil and gas development with the formation of the Petroleum Sarawak Perhat, Petros, on August 25th. Leading the newly formed Petros is former State Secretary Tan Siri Tato Ama Dr. Hamid Bugo, who has had prior experience in the oil and gas sector. And to complement these development aspirations of the state, the Development Bank of Sarawak, DBOS, was officially launched on November 3rd to ensure continued balance between the state's investments and reserves in an effort to speed up development efforts. With a paid-up capital of RM500 million, the DBOS is expected to commence operations on January 1st, 2018. 
concerning Sarawak's equal partner status as outlined in the Malaysia Agreement 1963, MA63, a team of lawyers travelled to London to search for studies and references related to the state's rights under the agreement. While in London, the research team found documents on the continental shelf confirming the ownership rights of the state to the natural resources on the seabed and in the subsoil of the continental shelf within the boundaries of Sarawak as defined in the Order in Council. Assistant Minister of Law, State Federal Relations and Project Monitoring Sharifa Hashida Said Aman Ghazali, who led the team to London, said these were among the findings they had come across through research and study of the documents, which originated from Sarawak before September 16, 1963. She said the documents obtained by the team would add strength to the state's position in discussions with the federal government on the devolution of powers and towards resolution of various constitutional matters under deliberation in these discussions. The Native Customary Rights NCR land issue continues to be a much debated topic. The state government has pledged to continue to assist in resolving the issue. A special task force headed by Deputy Chief Minister Dr. Amar Douglas Uga Ambas was set up to address the various issues affecting NCR land status. On November 13th, some 1,000 people gathered at the Old Courthouse near Kuching Waterfront for a peaceful NCR land rally. The rally was aimed at creating public awareness of the frustration of the natives of Sarawak over the alleged exploitation of their native land. In the political arena, on May 12, the State Legislative Assembly, Dune, resolved to disqualify Dr. Ding Tiong Chun, DAP Assemblyman, as an elected representative over the issue of his purported dual citizenship. This followed an overwhelming 70 votes from BN Assemblymen in favour of a ministerial motion to the effect, tabled by Dr. Siri Wong Sung Ko. Dr. Ding subsequently filed an originating summons in the High Court on June 7th to challenge the decision. The High Court overturned the Dune decision and reinstated Dr. Ding. However, an appeal by the government is still pending. And following the flow of opposition news, DAP Sarawak, PKR Sarawak and Amana Sarawak officially formed a coalition called Pakatan Harapan Sarawak on September 13th to take on BN in all the 31 parliamentary seats across the state in the 14th general election. In a joint press statement, DAP Sarawak Chairman Chong Jian Jian, PKR Sarawak Chairman Baru Bian and Amana Sarawak Chairman Fitzwan Zaidi also disclosed that they had concluded seat allocation negotiations among the three parties for GE14. Looking towards Sabah, 13 people including Party Warisan Sabah President Datuk Seri Shafi Abdal, Vice President Datuk Peter Anthony and Party Youth Chief Datuk Muhammad Aziz Jaman were detained by the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, MACC, for alleged siphoning of federal funds worth RM1.5 billion for rural projects in Sabah since 2009. It is understood that MACC was investigating a major corruption scandal involving the Rural and Regional Development Ministry where funds meant to carry out improved amenities and infrastructure in hardcore poor areas were allegedly siphoned off by certain officers who were believed to be working in cahoots with several companies. Saifi has repeatedly denied any wrongdoing or link with any companies MACC was investigating and believed the whole incident was politically motivated. In the court scene, the biggest story of the year was that Datok Stephen Lee Chi Kiang, who is a suspected mastermind of the infamous Bill Kayong murder, has walked away free after he was acquitted by the court. 46-year-old Lee, along with two other accused, 38-year-old Lai Chang Lun and 51-year-old Qin Wei Chung, were discharged and acquitted. The High Court ruled that the prosecution had failed to furnish evidence linking the trio to murder. However, the main suspect, Mohamed Fitri Baus, was ordered to enter his defence, and his trial will continue on June 14th. A crime of passion ended with a woman being sent to the gallows for abetting in killing her husband. On October 28, Judge Dayuk Nochaya Ashad ordered Ling Hangzi to be remanded in Kuching Prison pending her appeal. Ling was charged with Andrew Tiong King Guan for killing her husband, Wong Jing Kui, a bank manager at their house on June 14, 2012. Ling has been convicted under an alternative charge under Section 304A of the Penal Code for culpable homicide not amounting to murder. He had pleaded guilty and got a 16 year jail term. Dong is currently missing, and the bank manager's family is now offering RN 50,000 for any information leading to the arrest of Dong. 
On October 5th, two men were shot and killed in broad daylight at a coffee shop at Palawan Road. The police identified them only as Lao 47 and Law 21. They died on spot. The noon attack occurred when they were drinking with a Chinese national woman at the sidewalk of the cafe. The assailant, wearing a helmet and red jacket, approached them, whipped out a gun and fired several shots five meters away before fleeing on a motorcycle. He was believed to have used the pistol based on the casings found at the scene. Lao, known as Akang, was involved in two shooting attempts in 2012 and 2014 to kill him. He escaped both attempted killings, but his late wife died in the 2014 shooting. And finally, ending our segment with the most bizarre news event of the year, on April 4th, villagers in Bukit Alp uncovered a graveyard of frozen chicken wings buried by the custom departments. The imported chicken wings were taken in for burial in trucks, and villagers were digging them out to sell them at RM5 to RM7 per kilogram. After the news spread, townsfolk went through a chicken wing phobia and stayed away from them for months as they feared that the wings would cause poisoning. The Police Residence Office Health Department, Cebu Municipal Council and Cebu Rural District Council worked together to tackle it and promptly cordoned off the burial site. The ordeal thankfully created no harm as there was no reported instances of food poisoning.